Thank you for that. So this is the first of our attempts at hybrid seminar. So we're trying to work out a few of the wrinkles and understand the technology. But thank you for those of you who are in the room and, and thank you uh, for the larger group that has joined via Zoom. I'm Jeff Kahn. I think you must know who I am already, but let me just introduce myself really quickly. I'm director of the Berman Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome everybody to the 2022 seminar series. Hey, guys in the, in the food area, we can hear you. Okay. So we're um, launching after two years of hiatus and doing everything on Zoom back to in-person and uh, hybrid. And it's my, my pleasure and, and privilege to welcome Insu Hyun to be the first uh, of our 2022 seminar speakers and, and the first to be willing to attempt this hybrid uh, featured seminar. I don't think you knew that when you were invited. You might have thought differently had you been okay. So Insu's here um, in person, which is also wonderful. And he's recently moved to a new position, which you, I'm sure you can see based on his bio and uh, the title slide, um, a new position. Maybe he'll say a little bit about that at the Science Museum of Boston. Um, but I know him for a long time from his, his work in academia, uh, mostly at, at Case Western University, where he has been very involved in um, ethics and policy related to emerging technologies in the life sciences uh, for many, many years. So it is a, a, a pleasure to welcome Dr. Hyun back to um, in-person presentations and, and for the first time, welcome to Johns Hopkins. I'm sure it won't be the last. Thank you for being here and please join me in welcoming Insu to the podium. There's one small thing we should do here because you won't be able to see your slides. There we go. Okay, all yours. Well, thank you so much. I've been involved in bioethics for about 25 years, and this is the first time I've been at Johns Hopkins, any part of campus. So thank you, Jeff, for inviting me and for the seminar organizers for breaking that long streak of not being here. Um, so I want to talk with you today about the black box of human development and sort of what's going on scientifically and in the area of guidelines and policy. And I would love to open it up for discussion toward the end with you and with the folks online. Um, so I don't really need to explain this to this audience, but there is what we call the black box of human development. And that's really the span of time from implantation all the way to about day 28, because during that black box period, it is extremely difficult, if not practically impossible, to study what is going on in human development at those crucial stages where the body plan starts to form and where a lot of pregnancies actually fail or where failure, to implant, failure for implantation in IVF clinics occurs. Um, so we know a lot about the, that period of development for other animal systems, but we know extremely little about the human case. Um, so there's definitely scientific merit in going forward and uncovering that box, exploring that. But then of course that runs into the question of um, what are the costs to be paid? to do such exploration. Clearly there are many benefits and I'll, and I'll mention them as we go along. But of course there are some social uh, costs that we have to pay. So let me um, to first start, I'm gonna sort of go through key milestones in the research and sort of give you an update of how quickly this field is progressing and where I think it's gonna go. I am gonna talk about the scientific and ethical implications of this work to a degree during my presentation, but I really want to hear from you and discuss with you more deeply those implications, so to speak. Okay. Um, so I'm going to begin with this experiment, which is just stunning, published in 2016 in Nature. Now, um, this is the first time that we saw evidence of the possibility that pluripotent stem cells, and it doesn't matter if they're iPS cells from you know, somatic cells or embryonic stem cells can self-organize into what look like early stages of embryo development. Now, what to call these things? Uh, an early proposal from George Church was self-organizing embryo-like structures or souls. And I thought uh, Church's souls is probably not the best way to describe these things. Although they do sort of reflect the idea of the, of, you know, the Aristotelian soul of a self-organizing biological principle. So in that sense, it's correct, but not in the religious sense. 
Um, so what happened here? Well, I like, you know, like we like to call this the warm flash paper after the first author, but um, Ali Brimelou and colleagues at Rockefeller University discovered that if you put chlorophyll and stem cells on a single layer tightly packed together in a circle, and you can actually uh, have different culture dishes that have different shapes, like, you know, kind of like little stipple dots, you can do triangles, you can do moons, you can do uh, circles. They found that if you pack them together in a circle of a certain diameter, Within just a couple of days, you get this pattern. It's amazing because you just add just a little bit of bone growth factor, you give it a little nudge, and then they self-organize repeatedly, consistently into the following. So you get the outer ring, which is uh, endoderm, next ring in, mes mesoderm-like cells are represented in the mesoderm lineage, and finally, um, ectoderm in the middle. So those, of course, are the three primary germ layers of embryo development, and even, um, even uh, there's a region that they describe as sort of, you know, a stacked region of cells that look like it's almost like a primitive streak-like region. So um, what's going on here? I've talked to a lot of developmental biologists about this kind of experiment, and they say, you know, it's amazing is that there must be some mechanical triggers that just consistently give you this patterning. So that's the biologist's explanation of what's going on, right? It's not like a, a, a mythical soul or the hand of God, but it's just chemical reactions. So there must be that the outer ring of cells doesn't have a cell on the other side that triggers developmental events that go in. Now, um, this work, of course, is even more exciting when you go three-dimensional. This is work by Magdalena Zernica Gates when she was at uh, Cambridge University in England. Now she's at, at Caltech. But this is mouse stem cells. And the, if you put them in a 3D gel matrix, they get even more complicated because obviously the squished down you know, two-dimensional embryo model is not super informative, uh, although the, it is nice to see the patterning. Um, so we'll get back to Magdalena's work in just a moment. But going three-dimensional is especially interesting. Now, what, what, you know, when you think about fertilization in the a body, um, you go from one cell to two to four to eight, et cetera. And eventually you get what's called morula, right? A, a, a collection of cells that are all identical, tightly packed together. It's like a floating stack of oranges. And there must be something about that arrangement. So yeah, one in the center is got surrounded by all these other cells. You have cells on the outside that don't have a cell on the other side. And that must create some kind of chemical cascade of events that cue in so that consistently again and again, you have embryo patterning formation in uh, early stages of life. So while all this embryo modeling was going on, uh, starting and getting reported, I started thinking about what implications this may have for policy because uh, the 14 day rule, which I'll unpack in just a moment, clearly applies to fertilized eggs derived from IVF clinics and the research you can do on them in culture. Does it or should it apply to these embryo models? And I was kind of pondering this question, working on a draft for a nature commentary when this work dropped on Star Wars Day, May the 4th, 2016. Two teams, Magda's team, Magdalena's team at that time in Cambridge, and again, Ali Bermanloo's team from Rockefeller, took fertilized eggs that were donated from fertility clinic patients who no longer needed them for the reproductive care, and they cultured, cultured them extensively, extended consecutively, up to day 13, both teams. Now, in the UK, they had to stop before day 14 by law, otherwise there would be legal penalties. In the US, they actually um, voluntarily stopped because there's no actually reinforceable rule in Rockefeller and New York and the United States that unlike the UK would force people to stop there. But for under general person's agreement internationally, they decided to go ahead and stop. Um, so what's fascinating is for the first time you saw photos of what looked like to be post-implantation stage human embryos that are proven to go on to create full human life if transferred into the womb because that's what they do in a fertility clinic context. And you get pictures like this. Um, and about day 13, they don't do well at that point. Um, and so the idea is you have to have them in more dynamic womb-like settings. But um, what was stunning about this work was it sort of had to force people like me and other scientists to kind of re-describe what's going on in the early stages of life. Because what I used to tell my students in bioethics is if you take a fertility clinic embryo and you culture it, um, you have to, at the implantation stage, about day four or five, you have to either implant it, freeze it, or you lose it. Because the conventional wisdom is they just fall apart in culture. They need to be implanted in the womb to get the triggers from the maternal body to go on to the next cascade of events. This shows that these, these will attach to a plastic dish and actually go on autopilot much longer than expected. 
that was stunning. <laughs> Didn't know that would happen. That all that activity is packed into that egg, and it uh, and it and it goes from there. So uh, we'll return to this a little bit later. But that was stunning work. So that led to the publication of this article in Nature, where we, uh, along with Josephine Johnson and Amy Wilkerson, who was uh, one of the regulators at Rockefeller University overseeing Ali Brivenloo's work, to this commentary, which we basically said, it's time now to revisit. We didn't say overthrow. We said revisit the 14-day rule for embryo research and just think about, uh, are there good reasons to extend it now that technically we can, looks like, get past day 14 of the naturally uh, created embryos and also rethink uh, whether they apply to the to the embryo uh, models themselves. So um, the 14 day limit was made famous by the UK Warnock committee headed by the philosopher Mary Warnock. And then the key collaborator there was Anne McLaren, the famed developmental biologist from also the University of Cambridge, who I heard as a graduate student helped develop mouse IVF for research to transfer mouse embryos to different surrogates to study development and pregnancy, et cetera. Um, so uh, they were, they were uh, key figures in the early policy formation that eventually became law in the UK. Um, now, Couple of things to point out about this. They did in the very beginning of their deliberation talk about kind of like the big picture questions. Like, should these are I think questions that today seem a little bit quaint, but back then when IVF was first starting and they decided we need to have regulation and some policy around this new technology, one question was: Does the couple have to be married to take to take on this new technology and reproduce? Can somebody use this as a single person? Right. So, of course, we know today answer is of course, but back then that was an immediate topic of debate. Another immediate topic of debate is: Do all these have to go into a womb, or can we study them? Okay. So, reproductive use versus research use. That question they answered very early on, and surprisingly, they said, "No, no, no, we can use that for research." But then that then led to the question of, well, the how long? Can you study them? Should, should we draw a line in the sand? And what Mary Warnock thought was, we'll never get this past parliament if we don't have some kind of limit. People are, we're not gonna get the votes to, to enact this, this embryology act if uh, we don't have something that the politicians can say, look, there's a line in the sand here, though scientists will not go beyond a certain point. So uh, where to put that line? Um, so that's when Anne McLaren came in because it was very important to just talk about human development or what we know about mammalian development at that time. And they settled on the primitive streak formation, right? So this typically they believe in human happens around 14 consecutive days of development. And um, it was a convenient stopping point because uh, as Mary Warnock said, you can just mark off a fortnight on your lab calendar. You can just say, we started an experiment here. We've got to end it there. It gives people you know, a timeline that they can enforce. Apparently, this is observable. The formation of a pyramid streak, they believe, because they can see this in other animal systems, is, is observable under a microscope. So there's some kind of signal that is beginning. So you know, you know you're getting close to that point. So it had all kinds of practical advantages. Um, what's really interesting now is when we think about how would we actually enforce the 14 day limit? I've been hearing conversations among scientists of like, well, what methodology are you using to, to track primitive streak formation? Because they're different microscopes, a different thing. You know, is it like when the cells are just starting to migrate or is it, because it's the process, it's not just a single event. So there are even some practical questions now about how actually to enforce this now that people can go right up to the limit at this point. But this was a you know, biologically significant time point uh, because it was the first major event after fertilization. And I would say after blastocyst formation, which is the first time you have the trifecta derm that surrounds the inner cell mass and where stem cells come from. Um, and so uh, this post, uh, a convenient point for a lot of people to sort of agree upon. Now you can get a little bit more philosophical and theological because you might say, well, this is the first time at which biological individuation happens. You get a north-south axis, a left-right orientation. You have the primitive streak, which people believe may eventually become part of the central nervous system. And this is when the body plan starts to begin. You get the cell migration and you get the, the emergence of the three germ layers. So it's a significant point because at this point, it's believed that the embryos cannot split any further into twins and they can't really be fused together, although I'm not sure about that second point. Um, and so this is really when the first time it becomes a biological individual could be claimed. 
And apparently this was good news for some people who thought, um, you know, moral status comes when the soul enters the body. So this must be the first time in which a soul could enter the body because souls are indivisible. You can't split souls or unite souls. And if the, if the little embryo thing can split or fuse, then it would really have to be at the point where it can no longer do that stuff physically. And so it satisfies some theological constraints as well. I never was really super convinced about the individuation argument. Maybe we can get into this a little bit later when we talk about the implications, because I always thought, I mean, why can't you just say you're individual unless you, until you're not? Somebody invents a, a, a travel, like a space continuum travel machine. And they say every once in a while, when you step into this, you might split into two copies. One goes to Mars and one stays here. Um, am I not an individual until that happens? I think I am, even if the potential is there. So anyway, we can discuss that further. So it was very convenient. Now the question is, what kind of rule is the 14-day limit? If it's a moral rule, then you have to come up with the moral arguments to either keep it or to move it. If it's a public policy tool, then we have to go through the public policy uh, approach. So it's a very important question to ask, like, what kind of rule is it if we're going to revisit it to know what are the conditions for debating the rule? and possibly changing the rule. So some people view it as a, as a moral line. Before day 14, you can do research. After that day, somehow it's morally wrong to do research on that thing because the status is somehow changed morally. And others think it's kind of like, you know, political and social uh, kind of consensus around that. It's not really a philosophical line. I've always thought, because of my background in philosophy, I'm not aware of anybody like Socrates or Kant saying, Primitive streak formation is important for moral status. I think primitive streak formation is supposed to be the signal for something else happening, and it's that something else that's important for moral status. I don't even think individuation is really that, but something about souls, something about personhood. And I think uh, people can debate whether or not this is the proper signal point for whatever that morally significant property is. Okay, so um, there are many versions of the 14-day limit. I'm going to just put up some of them here and just point out a few interesting things. The 14-day limit actually was first uh, articulated, even mentioned on paper in the U.S. in 1979 through a different committee, uh, which never got its embryo research guidelines ever uh, instantiated because it was, it was too hot of a political topic. Um, but uh, I go into this in some detail in some other paper I'm going to mention later. There are some practical reasons for drawing the line of 14 days because they wanted a national guidelines policy and there were several states that had different laws on the books about research on fetuses in utero after implantation. So they want, didn't want to confuse the national policy with laws that could be triggered in some states. So they said, let's just steer clear of the implantation point. And so there was that sort of, I think, practical reason for drawing the line there. Now, clearly the Warnock Committee had a different view. It was a whole kind of consensus by, uh, by the committee to try to satisfy as many different diverse views as possible and still move the research forward. So it was kind of a public policy tool to allow some room for exploration, but without diving into a slippery slope. The first three all mention, you know, basically zygotes, human embryos, products of fertilization. It's not clear in the fourth one from the NIH embryo panel, yet again, another US committee that had brilliant, beautiful guidelines, never were instantiated because they were too politically hot. Clinton that time just dropped that potato and said, we're not gonna deal with that. So, uh, so we have to kind of look at like what would have been the case if we follow this. And they were, again, very flexible. You can see that they're actually quite permissive. You can even study a little bit of primitive streak formation if that's what you want to do, right? But then look at the very last part, you know. Uh, we're, of course, we're not talking about the development of cell lines from these spare embryos or thinking embryonic stem cells because, of course, these things are not involved in continuing to develop as an organized integrated whole. Hold that thought because uh, maybe we need to rethink that last little clause. But a very interesting because as we go on in time, you see different tweaks to the 14 day limit. Now, nowadays, it's not only for fertilized eggs, right? It's for anything that's created using human diploid cells that could become a baby, essentially. I'm just like paraphrasing the spirit of now the current 14 day limit. It can be from cloning, it could be from the kind of work that we're going to talk about in just a moment, or fertilized eggs. Right? So, how you made the thing is less important than what it could become. In a, in a uterine environment or in a reproductive context. So that's a very important flip because now that casts the Y potentially very Y to include the embryo models that I started with. Okay, so uh, there's international generally agreement about this 14 day limit now when uh, we published or were doing the proofs for the nature commentary, the editor asked, oh, into, can you come up with a nice picture of an embryo? And I thought, well, everybody does that. Let's just come up with a graphic that shows this. 
So, so we put this in the paper and I would actually, the, the, the lighter blue just means, you know, it's a guideline, it's not a law. Dark blue is there's actually by law, you cannot go beyond uh, 14 days and Switzerland is actually seven days. I would actually paint the whole globe minimally light blue because of the international guidelines for stem cell research, at least until last year. <laughs> so um, so I, it, it, was, it was very widespread. Now, if it's a law to change it, you have to go to, through the whole legislative process. That's very different than changing a guideline or institutional policy. So there's a very different processes. Uh, so not only is it important to ask what kind of limit or rule is this, moral, political, scientific, what is it? But sort of like, what is the process that you need to, to change that in your locale. Um, so let me flash forward a little bit, getting back to embryo modeling work. It's fascinating because it's going very quickly. So this paper came out in 2019 from Jinping Fu's team at the University of Michigan. Uh, I had the opportunity on a grant from Greenwald to work with uh, Jinping and colleagues just to talk more about like biological engineering, ethics, and this kind of modeling work. But what he did, because he's trained as an engineer, he was very unhappy with the embryo modeling work up to that point because he said they're all kind of different. They develop at different time points. They don't, they're not consistent and reproducible to be very useful for scientific studies other than just, oh, look at how cool this thing is as a one-off, right? Uh, so as an engineer, he said, we need this to be scalable, reproducible and controllable. So he came up with a microfluidic system. It's extremely simple. It's just two channels. And you just put the um, chemicals in one channel, load up the cells on the other channel, and it could just be human pluripotent stem cells of any kind. It works with human embryonic stem cells or iPS cells. It works with any pluripotent stem cell. You load up the cells and you just tilt it and let gravity take over. So the cells kind of go through these little channels, these little gaps. And it's like, it's like baking cookies. Like they, they come out consistent every time because they're all in the same culture medium. Right? So that's how you can get batches, literally batches, hundreds if you want, that are going to be genetically identical in all time and spaced apart. So instead of cooking cookies, baking cookies one at a time and hoping for consistency, you, you get a whole batch. So I asked Jinping, do they, do they have to look like this? This looks kind of, when you look at the film, it looks a little scary because it's like, it's like you're printing out all these embryos. He said, yeah, that's how you get the consistency. Now, what, what's the benefit of going this route? Couple things. One is you can use any cell line to get these embryo models. So you can actually get genetically matched embryos, which I said to him, careful, because that could be considered to be cloning by some people, uh, much more sophisticated, much more similar than nuclear transfer where you have different mitochondria. This is like all the same, everything's the same. So, um, so you, you, you get this, this system where you can churn them out and that will allow you to do drug screening assays because about 75% of the drugs that women are prescribed to take while they're pregnant have no data on what happens to uh, uh, impact of developing life that early on. So you can do chemical screen tests on these. And the other really interesting thing that they discovered was um, there are cells that migrate, see, see the green there? Cells that migrate down after just about four days. And those look like they're primordial germ-like cells. These are the kind of cells that eventually become sperm and egg. Okay, so they're able to generate unlimited supplies of primordial germ cells for research and possible future clinical applications. So when they did this and published this work, they got calls immediately from teams that were very interested in starting with genetically matched primordial germ cells and doing all kinds of experiments with them, even in the context of reproductive medicine. That's, that, that's stunning. Okay, so it not only does it provide things you can study, but it could generate cell types that on a consistent basis that are genetically matched. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so this is, this is the thing. Now, the, the key though is they're not complete embryo models. They left components out. And I told them, because this is part of our grant project, say, please, Jinping, can you promise me your team will never try to make, at least not in Ann Arbor, a complete embryo model? because there are laws against reproductive cloning in Michigan. And I want you to jail, Jinping, like you a lot. Okay, so, so please be careful not to do that. So they put this in their ethics statement and their methods. They may note that these are not complete. They lack those elements. Now you could probably put them in, but I, but I ask them, if you can answer your research question by not making a model of this everything, but just enough of what you want to do, and then across your data set with your different models, if you have the complete picture, that's probably the way you want to go, the safest. Even then, there was still a lot of question about whether NIH would continue to fund their studies. 
because NIH can't fund studies in which human embryos are created or destroyed in the process. So there's even just like a practical reason like that for funding to want to avoid this. So their team said, yeah, as long as we're in Michigan, we're, we're going to be careful, right? Because um, this is what the law says in Michigan. You can't do that. You can do embryo and embryonic stem cell research, but you got the 14 day limit and you, they ban reproductive cloning. In Massachusetts, where I am now, similarly, those things are in place. Right, so um, so you can get into a lot of trouble if 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 people interpret your work uh, in a way that would seem that you are breaking these strictures. So we need more guidelines for this area. I ended up publishing this with a, a several co-authors around the need for guidelines for research. Eventually, these became um, uh, brought in to the uh, International Society ISSCR guidelines, which I'll talk about in just a moment, very briefly. Um, but what we said was, look, there are two different kinds, broadly speaking, embryo models. There are those that are integrated and non-integrated. Okay, so um, integrated are ones that have like every, what you believe are every cell type necessary to support a pregnancy. So not just the embryo proper in three different germ layers, but also the extra embryonic tissues that, that are required for implantation and for supporting life. So if you don't have an embryo model that's fully integrated, or even like the Jinping Fu models that lack yolk sac and other elements, uh, our recommendation was, well, that's just a cell culture research. As long as you have consent from the original cell line donor for some work like that, reasonably, if you can argue that, um, doesn't really need any special extra review because it's not going into an animal. It's not going into a person. It's just all in vitro work. So that's our recommendation at that time. If they are uh, more complex, if you disassemble them at the time of permanent streak formation and you study the components, that should be allowed to go as well without further, exam, uh, further review. You shouldn't transfer these models into a uterus of an animal or a human, whether they're integrated or not integrated. But then the key question we sort of left hanging was, yeah, but what about the culture of embryo models that are quote unquote more complete that are, that are integrated? All right, so this is gonna be the key question because I don't think many people would really argue about the you know, the ethical um, wrongfulness of making like partial models of, of, of these, but it's really when you get into the question of what can this do if it goes into a reproductive context? So things are going very quickly because I, I've always thought, well, you know, I really hope that nobody tries to model the whole thing. And then this paper comes out, two groups in nature. Um, so um, Jun Wu's team, he's at UT Southwestern in Texas. Uh, I don't know what it is about these folks in Michigan and Texas that keep flirting around with this early human life. But, uh, but anyway, he's in that uh, red state. And Jose Polo's team in Australia, they both independently came up with basically the same result, which is amazing to me. Okay, so now um, they take human stem cells, whether they're from in the, in the A portion, from a embryonic stem cell line from the human blastocyst or from adult human cells that are transformed into iPS cells. In any case, you get human pluripotent stem cells. You start with those, you put them all together in this uh, ag agro well plate. And then through their culture system, it actually forms into a little blastocyst like thing called, uh, I think they're calling them eye blastoids. I don't know if there's a connection to Apple, but, uh, but anyway, a little blastoid model that's supposed to be like the pre-implantation stage blastocyst that uh, typically in a fertility clinic, you transfer to the womb for pregnancy. Um, Jose Polo's team just took a bunch of reprogrammed cells. Uh, they didn't start with all like pluripotent cells. They, they were a little further along, put them in a cocktail and basically end up with the same thing at the end. Okay, now, I think it was Jun Wu's team did something really amazing. They took, for example, induced pluripotent stem cells, which come from skin or other somatic cells, right? made them into the cell type that then makes the blastoid. And that's actually the blastocyst is the stage in the fertility clinic where you uh, get your human embryonic stem cells. That's when the inner cell mass forms and that's when you can actually derive human ES cells. So they did that to the blastoids and they got, I don't even know what to call these, right? Because they're IPS cell derived, blastoid derived, chlorophyll stem cells. Um, the other thing, so, so it kind of keeps going around. So then you can like reconstitute from a, a patient sample, something that's looked kind of like a blastocyst back when they were a blastocyst. Um, what's also surprising to me is if you use human embryonic stem cells, you can, I think, reconstitute the original blastocyst. 
right? So what happens in the fertility clinic, what I tell my students is you disaggregate what's called the trifectoderm. You take out that, that outer layer, which eventually becomes all the support tissue, everything that you leave behind in the maternity ward when you take the baby home, except I guess if you take the placenta home, that's not true in all cases, but, uh, but you leave all that other stuff behind and what you actually get from, that becomes the baby is the inner cell mass. So the baby proper gets transferred into a plate and it becomes the human embryonic stem cell line. So what happened? Did you kill the baby? I don't know. You kind of spread it out like on a big sheet and it keeps reproducing. In this case, you can put them together again and you can get that blastocyst back. So that's kind of amazing. It's kind of like, well, it kind of went a little detour into, into a cell line and then they got, you got basically the blastocyst back. Now, just to be clear, the blastoid models here, they're not identical. So there are some spacing issues and there are some unknown cell types that appear. But this was the first round. Okay, I think you can clean that up pretty quickly. Now, I always wonder, well, why would you scientifically want to do this if the justification is we have to study the black box of human development. These models and embryo cultures will allow us to uncover the black box and we can get you materials that we otherwise can't study. You can study blastocysts all day because they're everywhere, the fertility clinics. So you can't make that argument. We're unable to study things, you know. So I guess the only other rationale would be we want to kind of push this toward reproductive use and or we can modify the cell lines, do genetic manipulation and look at how glasses for, glasses formation in that stage is affected by genetic manipulation, which you can't do with um, IVF clinic embryos. So there's gotta be some other rationale for doing this. And I think we need to think a little bit more about what are these other rationales? If it's not the rationale, if there's no other way to study that period of development, of course there is, we have natural glasses system. Okay, so uh, let me start rounding things up here. Things are going very, very quickly. So this just came out a few weeks ago, back to Magdalena, back to the mouse. Now they are following the work of Jacob Hanna, who's also one of the authors here, Jacob Hanna from Israel. Uh, you may have heard of this like a few weeks prior. To, I think this Jacob Hanna paper came out August 5th. This one's August 25th, so 20 days later. But on August 5th, Jacob Hanna reported that they took fertilized mouse embryos, put them into this special bioreactor. It kind of looks like a little Ferris wheel with all these different like wells and these kind of spin it and it mimics the womb environment much better than just a, a Petri dish, right? Um, and those fertilized mouse eggs got up to 8.5 days of the womb, which is like just short of halfway through the mouse gestational cycle and started forming early organs, started forming early part of the brain, et cetera. So then what they do with this is now, can you do the same thing, not with fertilized mouse eggs, but with mouse stem cells? And the answer is yes. So guess which one of these two is the natural mouse embryo and which is an embryo model? Which one? Who thinks the one on the top is the embryo model? No? So the one on the bottom is the one on the bottom. But pretty dang close, right? So you get very early brain formation. You got forebrain and midbrain. They haven't got hindbrain yet, but they think they might be able to figure that out. And you got early organ formation. They claim you have beating heart, but people say, well, it's not really a beating heart. It's more like you got some beating cardiac cells. But, uh, but both for the natural embryos, so, so the one on the top is the fertilized egg that's gone to 8.5 days. And the embryo model, they, they, they kind of stop at 8.5 days. Not really sure why. Okay, but I mean, just that, look at how fast it went from that very early slide I showed you of the red and the blue cells in 3D to this. Now the question is, what if they take an embryo model of human, human cells and get up to uh, early organ formation? I think they're probably working on that. So that's why I was wondering, well, okay, should you have the same standards for natural embryo cultivation that you have for embryo models? And what about integrated versus non-integrated? These are exciting and interesting questions. So the guidelines for the International Society for Stem Cell Research came out uh, last uh, May. And, um, and so we tried to address some of this. In fact, Deborah Matthews is here, worked on these portions of the guidelines. If you have any tough questions, I'm gonna direct them right over there to Deborah. But, uh, but what did we say, um, or what did, what did the team say that came up with the, these aspects of the guidelines? This was a biggie, big step. That 14 day limit that was, you know, I say it kind of painted the whole globe light blue in terms of guidelines don't go past that. That was quietly um, moved, right? Out of the prohibited category to 
let's review and let's discuss this category. Now, I just want to just defend that move for just a second, because in the context of these guidelines, the only things that made it onto the prohibited list were things that were either widely believed to be unethical, and you can't say that this is widely believed to be unethical because there are people like me debating this, okay, so it's not like a clear answer, or there's no scientific merit to doing that kind of study. Well, there's probably some scientific merit for doing this. So we couldn't justifiably keep it anymore in that category three prohibited category, given how we define that category. So it got by default into the, we have to discuss it category, category two, a full review. Okay, and this is what this, I won't read it, but this is what basically the, the statement says, there has to be public dialogue around this before we move forward. Now, knowing that this was coming, Oh, by the way, just real quick about the embryo models. Yeah, so pretty liberal here. What the guidelines say is if they're non-integrated, doesn't need any kind of specialized stem cell review. Of course, you might have normal IRB review if it's, if it's um, appropriate, but nothing additional to just what you normally do with cell cultures or tissue cultures. Integrated models, they are you know, uh, required to go through some kind of specialized overview process for embryo research, but there's no time limit on this. Now, of course, this was before the work that Magda just showed with the mouse going to 8.5. So I'm really curious to see, are we, are we sticking with this one here? No time limit, really. Uh, they look pretty similar, right? Uh, of course, everyone agrees, there's no scientific merit to doing transfer to a human or non-human uterus. But as we know, people are trying to mimic a uterine environment with bioreactors and other forms. So that may actually not even be an important step anymore. Um, so that's where things stand with the models. Now, knowing that these changes were coming, I uh, got permission from the International Society because I was on that committee for the guidelines and said, can we give people a little bit of a heads up and kind of prepare them a little bit for this, this pretty big shift? And so I actually recruited co-authors who are not part of the ISSCR guidelines task force and actually were not themselves involved with human embryo research. So my co-authors are Annalene Brendanorn. I don't know if some of you know her. She's a, a, now a Dutch senator. Um, but anyway, so Annalene bi Bioethicist, James Briscoe, who's the um, editor of the journal Development, Seagal Klipstein, who's the IVF clinician, who's also the chair of the Ethics Committee for the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, and Tao Tan was very interesting. He did the work in China of culturing monkey embryos to 20 days. And he knows that he's gonna to have to collaborate with many of these folks who wanna take, if, if, if allowed, human embryos up to like 20 or, or even further, right? So we uh, together just try to map out a little bit, what would it actually mean to move reasonably, responsibly past the primitive streak? Like what does that actually look like? And what are the considerations you would have to take into account? So obviously you need to have scientific justification. You have to be able to say that there's no other way to study this very important research question. There's a lot kind of assumed by what we mean by scientific justification. We need to unpack that quite a bit. In fact, all throughout the ISCR guidelines, we keep appealing to there has to be a strong scientific rationale. There has to be strong scientific justification. We don't actually like, explain what that is. You can't just say, well, this might one day help a lot of people, you know, like the first line in the grant or first line, like, like, like people kind of submit to an IRB. Everybody says that, right? By studying this, we may one day address Parkinson's disease. Is that good enough? That's a pretty low bar, right? Um, so we're actually in the process of working that out a little bit more. I, I'm, I'm heading up the ethics committee for ISSCR. We're working on that paper. Uh, we're a little bit behind, but, but we're working on it. So that's a very interesting question. Of what actually do we mean by scientific justification? Scientists and ethicists, I think, mean different things. Institutions might mean different things. The public might mean different things. We have to have well-defined increments. It's not just like, oh, go ahead, the door's wide open, go as far as you want. You have to say in the study, we want to study like just a day or two past 14 and just work out those increments and see if that's informative and if it's worth or even possible to go even further. It's not just opening the door wide open. Of course, independent peer review, there has to be public dialogue, informed consent from the people involved. Uh, separation of clinical care and research. Now, I just wanted to say a couple of things and then I want to open it up for discussion. A few things that I found very interesting about working on this, um, this essay for science. Um, the first was, I've heard again and again from people in this debate, from bioethicists, from policymakers, that the 14-day limit was a very comforting limit to the public. It assured the public the scientists would not go too far. Right? It, it kind of like has that like social soothing kind of reassurance role. 
What I found surprising though, was the editor of science said to me on the first draft, can you go back and explain what the heck the 14 day limit is? Because we don't think our readership of Science Magazine will know what you're talking about. Okay, so we had, so if you look at that article, there's a whole section I wrote it about the history of like, where does this come from and blah, 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 because the editor said, you need to explain this because people just may not know what you're talking about. That's the readership of that who have subscriptions to science, right? Um, so how could something be reassuring to a public if they may not be aware of it? I can tell you at the Museum of Science where I work now, I didn't do a poll, but I'm pretty sure the majority of all those science communicators have been working there for up to 20 years have never heard of the 14 day rule and they're science communicators to the public. My Uber driver from the airport probably doesn't know. Um, so, so, so who's actually being assured? So I think that's an empirical question that I think is probably under some doubt, just, just, on, just from the, the, the reflection I've had on this issue. The other thing that I thought was very interesting and I, want, and I wanted to then turn it over to a discussion is um, two things, one is, if it was never technically possible to get to 14 days or even, even past it, how much work does that structure actually do in research oversight? If it's a rule that couldn't be broken, then it's kind of symbolic. It's not actually doing any real lifting. So what actually did all the lifting? It was the unsung heroes of scientific justification, informed consent, all the other things that we put up here. That's that was actually doing the work of research oversight and and, and approval, right? So can we just continue to rely on those workhorses going forward? Um, so that's one, one reason why I think I'm pretty comfortable with what I put up here, because this is kind of the ideal case of what in fact was at play. Uh, the last point, yeah, I did hear from some people, scientists as I was kind of uh, drafting this, they said, well, and see, you know, it was, uh, nobody really tried to go up to the 14 day limit because they knew they couldn't go past it. It was just really kind of like, because they kind of knew that that line was already there, they didn't really try. And I thought that's kind of, I don't know, that's kind of undermining the, the, the technical breakthrough that Magnus Group and Ali did, because it was not easy. It wasn't just, oh, we just chose not to get close because there's a line there. I mean, there's so much value in getting to day seven. There's so much value in getting to day 10. You're telling me that they didn't even try because there was a line at day 14. That didn't really sound really convincing to me. When you talk to the researchers who did this work, uh, they were, they were, it was for them a very big breakthrough. One, two observations I thought was very interesting. So from Ali's team, they said, this is unpublished. They said that the same number of embryos that make it to day 14, 13 in the dish are roughly percentage-wise the same number, same percentage that make it to implantation and, and create pregnancy. Is there something that we can identify in the earlier days that would predict which of these extended embryo cultures would make it to day 13 that we could then use for clinical decision making. That's really interesting. Okay, so, so that you might end up with less embryo loss in the future if you continue, continue with this work. The other thing is that every day they came in, they were surprised they kept going. And after a while, they were like cheering it not, go embryo, go, right? And when they got to day 13, it was a little sad because they had to fix it on the slide. I thought if I was an embryo protectionist, which I'm not, but if I were imagining myself in that place, I would think it's regrettable that they made you for research or they're stunning you for research, but every day is precious. We should let it go as long as possible. I would actually think that's in favor of extended embryo cultivation because like every day is precious. I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not that, that person ethically, but, um, but I would think that to be conceptually consistent, that's what you would have to say. So I'm going to round off by saying, yes, there is a line in the sand with the 14 day limit. But, you know, I grew up in California. This is my favorite beach in Half Moon Bay. I grew up in California. We played all day on the beach, drawing lines in the sand. But we knew by the end of the day, the tides would shift and all those lines would get erased. So I think the tides are shifting very quickly in embryo research and we have to really rethink whether we need new lines. So that's it and I will take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Insu. Really interesting and um, very leading edge. So maybe we'll give pride of first question to people online. Deja, do you have anybody or should we go to the room first? Okay. So open, open for questions. And I think we're going to have to use the microphone so people online can hear. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Hi, my name is Ned. Um, I'm a postdoctoral fellow here. Um, really fascinating papers and presentation, and also a topic that I am thinking a lot about. So I was, it was, I learned a lot from reading reading your work. Um, so I wonder, in, it seems to me when I read um, at least one of the papers that your recommendation is to uh, adhere to the 14 day rule unless, and I wonder after all that skeptical talk about how arbitrary the 14 days rule is and the fact that the public is not attached to it because the public doesn't know about it, why, why, are you, why, why do we still defer to, why do you recommend still deferring to it as, as the default? Yeah. Uh, rather than just, you know. Um, so that's a great question, right? So, so if if I'm somewhat skeptical about the underlying rationale for the original 14 day limit, why why say? Because you're right. In one in one of our pieces, we say that should be kind of the default, and you should make a special case for why you should be able to go. That's not the small incremental forward approach. Why you want to go just a little bit past it? So the onus is on the researcher to have to do that. That's again, I think, just for policy reasons that people are just so used to that, and I think it, it would be a little bit um, disruptive if you just removed it entirely. That way, the onus is on the team to say we're qualified to do this. We have a backlog of work that shows that we might succeed, and we can come up with the, the special rationale. Um, so I think that that's probably the better way to go initially, because I think if you entirely remove it. Um, not that these experiments would work, but people might try to go forward too quickly. Now, the other thing that was pointed out to me by some of my co-authors, especially Tao Chan, is we have to probably rethink and re-engineer what's going on in the support system to get past 14. Okay, so just attached to a dish is not going to do it. So you saw the bioreactor, you saw that other stuff. So this research has to co-develop with other, re other technologies. Um, so they have to kind of move together. So I think that, that once that team is assembled, this is all to kind of avoid like just people just rushing ahead under the radar. Um, we need to monitor these initial steps going forward. So I, I kind of like this idea. I think it's politically more palatable for people to say that's still there, but you have to make a special case. And we're going to allow some teams that are very well qualified under close supervision to explore a little bit beyond that. I think that's an easier, again, it's not an ethical philosophical argument. It's more of kind of a, a policy kind of ease into it a little bit argument. Joey. Here comes a microphone. Hi, uh, thank you. That was a really interesting talk and so many thoughts. I guess I wanted to, to two things. So one that was, that was saying, so it seems like the way you frame uh, what's going on with uh, the 14 day rules, it's like a very pragmatic policy oriented thing, but it seems like the story that you told at the beginning is that there's a that that is a point of significant shift in moral uncertainty, right? So So we have a pretty stable story to tell before 14 days and then at that point, things change and, and we have new questions about what this means, right? And so at least uh, from that perspective, there is a justified philosophical reason where it's like, we have something significant happening and we don't know what the moral implications are, whereas before we can tell a clearer story, right? And so, it's, and so I guess uh, that, and so that seems like one reason to hold on to the, the primal streak 14 day um, thing. And, and so that was this, and this is sort of related, but I guess uh, I was wondering, so you question the comfortingness of it because most people don't know about it, but it seems like that is sort of the sense in which it's comforting, right? Where, where like anyone, every, like most of us probably don't know the rule, but like, or you know, most people, but assume that there is ethical standards that are being applied. And if you were to look into it, right, and that we're not debating it and da 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 right? And so the, and so it's not, it's sort of settled uh, and we don't have to worry about that. All of everything is working fine, but rate, like raising this debate again and, and bringing it up seems like it, it is, it unsettles this and that, that comfortingness actually really matters. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, th those are great comments. Um, so let me start with like your later, later questions first. Um, So the one thing I wish I, I had done in my published work that I, I just didn't, I, I realized I, I should have done, I didn't do, is to say a little bit more about, well, well what limit is there then? Because if it's just like case by case, incremental, like, like does it just keep going? And I would argue it would have to be like, it would be harder to justify the study if you start getting past 28 days, when, you, when you're no longer in that black box of human development, because they're probably under the scientific justification criterion, there are probably other, other methods, other ways to get your data that don't involve this highly socially contentious path forward. 
So I think there's a natural sort of point at which the, the, the research itself starts to get constrained. But we didn't, I didn't articulate that. So like, so there's no like apparent like other stopping point. So you're right. I'm kind of like the idea that, well, there's, there's some kind of stopping point, right? Uh, is, is probably a good move and we didn't do that. And ISSCR didn't do that. So then the question then is, well, then what, where are the breaks? And it would have to be something like the review process and people, they're even less clear about that than the 14 day limit, right? That rule. So, so I think as in terms of like actually making good on kind of like assuring the public, we have a lot of work to do and rethink that. So, so I agree with some of what you said there. Um, I can't remember what the first part of your question was, but. Oh, right, right, right. Okay, yeah. So, that, so um, there, there are two camps on how you might approach this like moral justification. If you, if you try to reframe this as a philosophical or ethical kind of uh, rule, um, I'm not a single criterion person for personhood. I don't think it rests on just one thing, rationality or whatever it is. But for people who are, they are kind of looking for that like threshold moment. I'm not, I'm not a single criterion person because you're always going to get cases where someone gets counted out. Like that's kind of dangerous, kind of put it on one thing. I'm, I'm a pluralist, which means like there are clusters of properties. When you get enough of them, you're done. You got moral status. But if you're a pluralist that way, it's going to be pretty far down, right? Kind of like maybe toward viability or something. That, that doesn't really help settle the, the embryo research in vitro question too much because that leaves open a lot. So for me, I, where I start to want to draw the line are things like what are public reactions to, um, to how far it's going? So uh, one debate that we had among scientists was, okay, there's something called the Carnegie Collection where they took like photographs or you know, images of different stages of development. So you actually, it's not a living movie. It, it, you don't see the process, but you kind of see snapshots every week of development. And so we're looking at the Carnegie stage, it's like, okay, it's like, where would you start to feel uncomfortable about publishing the video and the data from your experiment when it has the spinal cord, when there's a little heart beating, like, what, you know, because as you go along the stages, it starts suddenly becomes like recognizably some kind of like organism, right? It's got organs, it's got little beating systems. They all kind of look identical, by the way, mouse and human and everything, but, but kind of like imagine, you know, that the mouse those mouse embryo pictures and someone says, okay, we have the human data, here's where we are now. And that's more of, um, it's, I know it's not a philosophical argument, but sort of public support science and, and we need to kind of keep, keep them along. And um, I think there's the point at which the, the visualization, how it looks plays a big role in people's moral judgment. And, and so I, I, don't, I, I don't know where that comfort level actually is, probably when it starts to, to get long. But in terms of like individuation, primitive street formation, all mammals go through that. So that can't be this like single criteria view. That can't be the reason because like everything goes, the mice, mice go through that. How could that be significant? It has to be like, that's actually showing something significant in the human, but I think that's too early to separate out human from non-human moral status. So, but, but the great questions, thank you. I think Deborah. All right. We do have one from the chat. Um, it says, what would be a pragmatic way to further regulate this? Do you recommend differentiation between limits dependent on objective or type of research, origin of cells, et cetera, or rather a uniform pushing of limits for further weeks to keep it simple in regulatory terms? Yeah, so, um, so it depends on what kind of system you're in. If you're in the UK or other places where it's by law, you have a centralized authority, then clearly that, that it has to work through that authority. Unfortunately, in the US, we don't have any such system. So the best we could do is to have some kind of institutional oversight system that's kind of voluntary by the institution. I think in this case, it really has to be a, a, a decision in university leadership and administration kind of say, are we gonna be the university in the US that pursues this, right? Is Hopkins gonna do this? Are we, do we wanna be in the news for this? And it's gonna be kind of more of that level and putting together the, the right committee of oversight members at your institution to do that. So that's what I think the process will look like. What I'm hearing is there are some researchers in the US who are actually having that conversation right now with their administration. So my guess is in the US is gonna happen sooner than later, incrementally, like a little step past, and it'll be an institutional policy, institutional review. Uh, and it's gonna be kind of like region by region. Of course, the whole Dobbs thing, I don't know how that's gonna throw a wrench into the system, but um, but I think we're going to start. My guess is we're going to start with embryo modeling, 
It's going to start pushing this, and they're going to get more and more complete. And then the question is, how do we validate these models? How do we know that these models of nature are the real, really representing the real thing? Because you saw in the mouse studies, they have the real thing, and you have the mouse uh, model, and you're comparing them along the way. How are you going to develop a model system for human, even if it's non-integrated, that you know that's actually telling you what's happening in the womb? You have to do, that's what you have to do, extended embryo culture at some point. So it's, it's going to be that dance in the US, and it's going to be, I think, institution by institution. The first institution that comes with a policy, so people might say, we like that or we don't like that, we'll copy it or we'll do something different. It's going to be incremental and it's going to be um, scattershot in the US. That's my prediction. I think we need to be done on that. Um, thank you, Vinsu, again. Wonderful to have you here. Thank you all for coming in person and online. I'm, I'm sure you'll stay to chat with those who want to do so informally. Let me take a little bit of camera time. I hope that can be seen. Yeah. So um, just to say that a week from today will be the inaugural Carlton Haywood uh, Memorial Lecture and um, surrounding um, panel discussions and, and other conversations. That's a, a most of the morning event starts at 10. I'm looking at Deborah to confirm. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. 10 till 1, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. over in the Turner Concourse, which is part of the medical school complex. I'm sure you'll be able to find it and we'll send out um, messaging online. So with that, um, thank you all for coming. Thank you again, Insu. Wonderful um, topic, a wonderful conversation, wonderful to kick off our seminar series for the fall. So thank you for being here. And with that, we'll be adjourned. Thank you all.